Welcome to episode 86 of Duties of the Heart by Rabbi Nubahiya ibn Pakuda, and we are about to complete the third chapter. We're up to 30, number 30 out of 30 in this uh, range of 30 ways to self-account. And Rabbi Nubahiya is going to give us a couple of examples, uh, but he's going to finish off with a very uh, interesting conclusion to teach us a lot about the concept of self-accounting and our plight as a stranger in this world. So he begins, a, to complete the 30 ways, a person should make an accounting with himself of the conditions incumbent upon a stranger in this world and should regard his position in it as similar to that of a stranger arriving in a foreign land. The stranger knows no one in the city that he has come to, nor does anyone know him. The ruler of the city, however, pities him his plight as a stranger and teaches him how to rectify his situation there. He provides him with daily bread and commands him not to disobey his word or violate his commands. He promises him reward and threatens him with punishment, as befits the time and the place. He warns him that one day he will have to leave, but does, does not tell him when. Amongst the conditions incumbent upon the stranger are humility and lowliness, surrender of pride, and renunciation of arrogance and haughtiness. As it says of the stranger's situation, and he quotes from Genesis 19 verse 19, this one came to reside as a stranger, and now he would be a judge. Further conditions are that he be ready to move on and relocate and not feel settled and secure. As it says in Vayikra 25.23, the land cannot be sold permanently, for the land is mine. For to me you are strangers and temporary residents. <clears throat> Further is the condition that he studies the laws and statutes of the land and the duties he owes the king. As David, peace be upon him, said in Psalms 119, I am a stranger in the land, do not hide your commandments from me. Further conditions incumbent upon a stranger are that he love other strangers like himself, help them and assist them as it is written, you must love the stranger. That's from Deuteronomy chapter 10. And also from Vayikra 19 verse 34, the stranger who resides amongst you must be to you as the native born among you, and you shall love him like yourself. A further condition is that he hasten and be quick to devote himself in the service of the ruler of the city, since he has no one who will pity him and intervene on his behalf if he should fall short in his service. For his situation is the opposite of that of the Shunammite woman, who, when asked by the prophets, and he quotes from Malachim chapter 4 verse 13, might there be cause to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? And they answered, I live among my own people. That is, my own people and family will speak to him on my behalf, if need be. The situation of the stranger, however, is not like this. But as it says, and he quotes from Psalms 142, I looked to my right hand and behold, there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me, none cared for me. Further conditions are that he be content with the livelihood that is available to him and with the housing and apparel he finds and that he conduct his affairs so as to obtain basic needs and not overwork. A further condition is that he prepare himself for departure and give thought to the provisions that he will need on his journey. Further, a favour, however small, should loom large in his eyes and he should express deep gratitude to his benefactor. A further condition is that, if he should suffer misfortune or harm, he bear it patiently, since he is broken-spirited, lowly, and powerless to prevent it. So Rabbeinu Bahia is giving us, basically, a, a way to be on this, uh, in this existence, uh, to, to feel as if you've wandered in on a country whose king has taken you under his wing and has uh, and tells you look just you know do this and do that don't do this and don't do that and everything will be fine um, and it's uh, and you know not and to be ready to uh, to be to, to realize this is a transient existence 
which is very important to understand. Um, and he continues now, um, talking to us directly. So he continues, So, accept upon yourself, my brother, the conditions incumbent upon a stranger in this world, for you are truly a stranger in it. Proof that you are a stranger and alone in the world is as follows. When you came into existence and were formed in your mother's womb, if all the people in the world had tried to speed up this process by a single moment or delay it by a moment, join one limb to another or separate them, fashion one of your internal or external organs, cause one of the immobile parts of your body to become mobile or one of the mobile parts to become immobile, induce you to emerge from your mother's womb before your predetermined time or detain you until afterwards by even a split second, make your birth easier on you or more difficult. All these efforts would have accomplished nothing. Similarly, after you were born into this world, no human being could have provided you with nourishment without God's help or made your body grow larger or smaller. Imagine that the whole world was yours alone and had no other inhabitants. This would not increase the means of livelihood accorded you to the end of your days by as much as a mustard seed. Conversely, if the number of people in the world were multiplied many times over, this would not diminish by as much as a mustard seed or more or less than this, the sustenance predetermined to be yours. None of the created things can help or harm you. None has the power to add to the days of your life or detract from them. The same applies to all of your characteristics, natural qualities and actions, good or bad. This being the case, what relation is there between you and the other creatures? What bond is there binding you to them or them to you? You are but a stranger in this world. It would not help you if there were more people in it. It would not harm you if there were fewer. You are in this world but a lonely, solitary figure who has no companion but his master, no one who will be kind to him except his creator. Therefore, my brother, serve him alone, just as he alone created you, governs you, provides for you, sustains you in life and brings you death. Place his law and his book before your eyes. Hope for his reward and fear his punishment. Accept upon yourself the conditions incumbent upon a stranger to which I have called your attention all the days of your life in this world. Then you will attain the rapture of the world to come. As King Solomon said in Proverbs twenty four fourteen. so too, no wisdom for your soul. If you find it, there will be a future and your, your hope will not be cut off. Uh, so fascinating there from Rabbeinu Habachia and uh, really quite, uh, quite striking in his tone in this final section of this third chapter. Um, and he's ba basically bidding us to realize you can rely on no one else 100%. Apart, I mean, you, you could consider your parents, you would have a similar relationship to your parents where you can trust uh, unconditional love. But with God, this is the parent's parent. Uh, this is very important to understand. This is uh, all your life, all your days, God will look after you um, absolutely and only wants the very, very best for you. Um, and he's going to... Um, uh, conclude this chapter with uh, again another direct uh, sort of uh, segments directed at the reader. These, my brother, are 30 of the ways in which a person makes a personal accounting before God. May he be exalted. If you undertake such introspection and hold yourself to an accounting in these ways, their light will break forth for you. Their radiance will surround you. Reflect on them always and meditate on them all the days of your life. Do not be content with my limited discussion and brief treatment of these ways, for each of their themes, when expanded upon and explained, contains so much more than I have mentioned. In bringing them to the attention of those who seek them, I have only remarked upon them briefly without elaborating, so that the book not be too long and deviate from its aim, which is to alert and to guide. Place them before your eyes and in your sight. Keep them in your heart and thought. Then, when you review them, their hidden secrets and spiritual instruction, which were not apparent to you at first, will be revealed to you. 
When you have studied them and understood the surface meaning of the words, do not think that you have already grasped all their inner meaning, for you can attain that from them only after you have reflected on them diligently and intensely, protectedly and repeatedly. Guide yourself by these ways and guide others to them. You will then attain the great reward bestowed by God as it is written in Daniel 12.3 Those who are wise shall shine like the brilliance of the sky and those who turn the many to righteousness shall shine like the stars forever and ever. And also he quotes from Proverbs 24 verse 25 For those who reprove there will be delight. So Rabbeinu Bahia is really bringing to the reader's attention the various levels that can be uh, gleaned from this book, uh, this guide. Uh, I've studied it uh, a few times, and I have to say you do um, different things, uh, mean different things each time you read it. Uh, It's almost as if it's like a three-dimensional book, even though I'm just reading black and white. Uh, It does have an incredible amount of depth and seems to kind of reflect the, your level at that point. Very, very interesting. And that concludes this third chapter, very long chapter, but really uh, quite incredible. It really is almost a book in itself, that, that third chapter of The Gate of Self-Accounting. And I look forward to um, going through the fourth chapter in the next episode.